Senator Morris is the Senate president, but he's also uh, the driving force with the Drinking Water Trust Fund Commission as the chair of the commission. Uh, I want to personally thank him for all the work, uh, dedication that he's put into getting us this far, and uh, I'll ask him up. So, Senator. Well, thank you, Commissioner. The, um, this is an interesting day. I, I got here and I, I said, God, I got a massive headache. I don't feel good. Um, and I'm presenting on water, water, then the grocers, then a funeral, then the hospital association, and then electricity. Um, it's typical New Hampshire. We can't help ourselves. We all want to do good things. And I think that's exactly what's happening with this water trust fund. The governor put the charge in last year in February that um, he wanted me to take the trust fund and create what I think is the absolutely fantastic um, way of accomplishing distributing the money and getting pipes in the ground and solving more problems than we thought we ever could. Um, and we've done that in a little over a year, but we've had this money almost a year before that. And that's truly where New Hampshire made a decision that this money was not going to go into the general fund. This money was going to go to solve problems and we never get that opportunity. And it's $270 million that's been in this trust fund. And what this commission has done in a year is incredible. Not only did they follow the process that we were going to take 20% of the basis of the fund and get it out between 50% in grants, 40% in loans, and the other 10% we were going to use to solve problems. They've done that. The grant money um, is, has been awarded this morning, and that'll go through the process of going to fiscal and going to governor and council um, to create a project that I think is significant. And I think it's what we're looking to get you to do. It's certainly a project that thought out of the box, brought seven communities together, starts in Manchester and ends in Plastow. For those people in the southern tier that understand what a feat that is, um, it's amazing that the contamination issue in Plastow is going to get addressed by Manchester, New Hampshire. But that's exactly what we sought to do. And as we go on from where we did with the first phase, we certainly have had people on the commission try to develop a process very similar to LCHIP, a process that would make you become more creative. And I know you're going to hear from the department about cautioning you on how we go after this money and making sure we do it in the best way possible. I couldn't caution you any harder than to tell you when the commission meets to look at these projects that you're going to propose next fall or next August and September, we're going to be looking for creativity. We're going to be looking just like LCHIP does. We're going to be looking to models that basically say, we're working with the community, the developers, and we need you to finish it off. We're looking to build a model, much like going from Manchester to Derry, to Salem, to Wyndham, to Plastow, to Atkinson, to Hampstead. We're looking for models like that. We're looking for cooperation between communities. It's certainly what government doesn't do enough of. I see it every day. I met with a person yesterday about education funding and said, why didn't we build a fire station between Salem and Derry? Why do we have two? These things are ridiculous in government. And what I'm stressing with the commission is we're going to reward people that think out of the box. And that's certainly what I think's happened in a year. And I certainly believe as you go through the process today of trying to understand what we're offering, um, you're familiar with the process of get in line and get scored. That's happened for years. I sit on the other end of it on the appropriation end and there's never enough money. Today we have opportunities. We have opportunities for people to think about 101 expanding. We're talking about putting infrastructure down there with gas. Why aren't we thinking about water? We should have been doing that with Route 93 when we built that 
project. I mean, a massive project like that, and we didn't lay a pipe. We certainly would have solved some problems that many of us have been dealing with for the last year with the Southern Tier project, I can tell you that much. But that's what I'm asking you to do. And as the department puts the guidelines in and as the commission does its work, I'm asking you to make New Hampshire a better state, just like we did with Elchip. Take it, expand it, get people involved, get other groups involved, get federal money involved, get everything you can. Because in the long run, we're trying to take 270 million and at the very minimum, we're trying to double it. LCHIP works on models at seven to 10 times the money that they have. And they've certainly worked with a lot less money than this commission has available to it. But we're certainly talking about construction projects. We wanna make it a successful year to come. We wanna make it successful. We've scored this to 2043, that we'll have this account open. And we certainly wanna make sure that we not only do that, but as we present to the legislature successful projects, that we get the legislature to realize that this account should be filled consistently because it will make a difference in the state of New Hampshire if we're leading to make sure there's clean drinking water delivered to everyone in the state. And that's what the governor believes in, it's what I believe in, and it's only gonna happen with your help. So thank you very much for coming today. And if there's any questions, you won't get to answered by me today, but <laughs> you can call my office. So thank you very much. Uh, first, was again, to thank all of the commission members. This has been a long activity. You'll get a little bit of briefing on the history of it from Gary. I'll go over a little bit of it myself. You will hear certain things repeated through the day because from where this originally started with the 50-40-10 formula to where the commission has decided we should go is a bit different. And I feel like the person who everybody's coming to a wedding reception thinking it was an open bar and I'm the guy they put out front to tell you, no, it's a cash bar. Um, this is about getting the maximum impact from the dollars we have. We have a billion dollar problem and we have $270 million to solve it with. That's not gonna get solved by giving everybody huge grants. So I'm talking about the framework. Uh, first thing is just a little bit of history. This was, as Senator represented, created by Senate Bill 380. He was a big part of that. Took funds in from ExxonMobil. You may have heard the MTBE fund. There's a difference and Gary will go over this. There's the MTB settlement fund that has very strong restrictions on it. And then there's the trust fund which was set up with the ExxonMobil uh, ruling where they lost and has the interest and everything else from that. That money, we've got more flexibility and the commission has come up with how they wanna go spend that money. And that's very different from settlement. Uh, the way that the commission came up with this is they set up a subcommittee, had us go off and really study, how do you come up with a set of processes to award loans and grants stretch the money as far as possible and yet have the greatest impact possible. And we came up with that framework. It was established through public meetings and stakeholder review. And then that was presented and voted on by the commission is now how we're gonna move forward this year. Uh, one of the things we are pointing out is this is not the final set of rules. Uh, LCHIP was mentioned. They've changed their rules and their procedures a number of times. This is where we're starting this year. If you see things where we could do it better, we're open to conversation, but this is how we're doing it this year because we got to get this round done. So big goals. One of them is we really want to maximize the benefits. If we spend all the money this year, then there's no money next year. And so the goal is how do we stretch those dollars, get the maximum impact and keep that fund going. Another important piece is the state revolving fund, which many of you are familiar with. If we don't keep that program going every year, if we run it, we get federal dollars into a pool that revolves through the state and keeps things going. When the trust fund runs out someday, that's the only thing we got left. So one of the key aspects of this key goals is to protect and maintain the SRF program and keep pulling those dollars in every year from the federal government. One of the big things is really maximizing loans versus grants. Very much like the Senator said, this is like LCHIP. If you need 10% to get over the finish line, that's where grants come in. The idea that you're gonna come in and get a 90% grant for a 10% loan, 
That's not where this is emphasized because that really minimizes the impact we can have across the state. Oh, sorry, I got a little lost. Uh, the other thing is there is funding set aside 10% from every year's budget that goes to other activities. This afternoon's session is about that non-construction. It's really about source preservation, studies, and grants to go out and figure out other things we can do. So the framework, uh, very much the idea is to get everybody to identify what you can bring to the table. Federal funds, loans that you take out, developer money, anything that you can bring to the table counts on your side of the ledger. What we then want is for every project to apply for a loan to close out whatever you need. So if you've got a $100 project, and I'll try to make math easy for myself, and you got $50 of it from developers in your area, and you got $20 that you've saved up, you got $30 left. We want you to ask for a loan for $30. We'll then go through the SRF process because we gotta maintain the SRF system. DES has its federal process, its federal rules. DES runs that, it's outside of the commission. Once that's done, those SRF awardees will be announced to the commission and the commission can then look at giving them grants. And the way we're setting it up is every loan application, and John will go through some of this later, and Rick, you have an application where you apply for your loan and on the back of it is your, rec your justification on why you should get a grant and how much grants you should get. That first shot at the grants is gonna be the SRF winners because they will be selected first, awarded first, and then the commission can take a look at giving them grants. And they can ask for grants, same as anybody else. If you did not get an SRF loan, and because some projects we're looking at don't qualify for SRF loans, that's gonna be a large number of projects. What we will do is a ranking. We've been given quantitative criteria from the commission saying, tell us what looks good against these criteria but then once it's on the commission's desk, it's up to the commission. They can take whatever we rank as number one and decide that's the worst project ever, and they could pick the one from the bottom of the stack and award it. It's entirely up to them. One of the key criteria, and they really want to stress this, is skin in the game. Uh, as Senator Morse talked about, LCHIP gets $7 for every $1 of grant money they give. And that's one of the biggest criteria. If you as a town or a group come in and say, we have scraped up 85% of this, we need 15% to get over the finish line, that's gonna get looked at a lot better than somebody comes in and says, well, we, we got $40 pulled together, can you give us the other 60? The commission was really strong on that. To stretch this money, they really wanna see skin in the game, pull in your developers, pull in the people who are gonna benefit from your activity, get them to put something on the table. Uh, just to give a, as a highlight, in the grants that have been given to date, it's been a three to one ratio. We didn't quite, quite get seven to one like LCHIP, but for every $1 of grant, the towns came up with $3, either through taking out loans or bonding or getting somebody to put money on the table or saving in advance. That's a pretty good ratio. We really like to do better than that, but at least do something along those lines. Uh, important thing that came up, uh, people did have questions of why are these different than SRF. There are a number of criteria. One, you can be doing an expansion, especially if it's an expansion to solve uh, contamination. That's definitely something the commission's in favor of. Economic development. If you're doing it for economic development, SRF cannot take that into consideration. The commission absolutely wants to take that into consideration. This is something to benefit the state. We're looking to get gains for the state out of this pot of money we got. Uh, another important thing that was asked for in the stakeholder meetings was the federal crosscutters that come with SRF loans, those do not apply to trust fund loans. The interest rates will be set by the 11 year bond rate, which is what we do SRF off of. On the federal, you get a little bit of a discount from that, but they have these crosscutters, American Iron Steel, um, Davis Bacon, all of those are taken off. You get a slightly higher rate, but all those cross cutters are gone. We got a lot of input, that, especially in smaller communities with smaller contractors, that was onerous, so those don't apply. Uh, that also means there's no principal forgiveness. So unless you get a grant, it's a straight loan. One important thing when you're going to take the loan, and, and this will be gone over in the workshops, is a lot of programs have gotten to the last pit they've needed an extra five bucks to go finish the project. They come into SRS, F, 
SRF has a little bit extra money, they give them a quick loan. SRF means federal dollars. Federal dollars, one federal dollar on a hundred dollar project means you have all the cross cutters on the entire project. So if you come in for that last one dollar from SRF, you gotta go back and do your bookkeeping for $99. Important difference. Um, the commission will look at these loan applications after they've decided which projects they want to award the loans to, they'll then pull the grant application off, take a look and decide what, if any amount of grant, they will award against the project. We talked about that. Okay, and then DES, after the commission makes these decisions, then swings back into action. We take whatever they tell us to go do, we administer that. It's important to understand that any loans or grants have to then go through the fiscal committee, so we actually get a budget to then do it. After it goes through fiscal committee, it has to go to GNC. And so that process after the decisions made by the commission until you actually get a check in the mail, it's not two weeks. It's more like two months plus. And that depends on you working with us on the paperwork. Same as an SRF loan. These are not simple loans. They just don't go out on a one-page form. It takes a little bit of time. So it is important that you work with us on that timing so we can get it out to you as quickly as possible. So that was a real quick overview of the framework. Now we're gonna have some people come up and fill in a little bit more of the details. First, Gary Lynn's gonna come up and talk about the history of how we got here, current projects that are running, and some of the kinds of activities that this is funding. Gary? So, my talk is about essentially how we got here. Um, and I think it's important to, to understand that uh, New Hampshire is unique. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, there, the opportunity that we have at, at this point in time, it's not something any other state has really put together. And it stems from the MTB litigation uh, that started over a decade ago. At the time of the litigation, we invited Vermont. Would you like to participate and help defray costs in other states? No one thought that it could be won, so we went alone. So we're the only state that uh, went through this process and obtained money uh, to address MTB contamination problems resulting from the widespread use of MTB in gasoline. That's the thing about uh, products. When they're in widespread use, there's opportunities for releases all throughout the supply chain and use of the materials. And they can pose a unique, a unique threat to uh, groundwater and drinking water resources. So the state undertook the MTB litigation and we ended up with uh, two sets of funds, settlement money and the trust fund. And I'm gonna update you and kind of uh, make sure everybody understands the background a bit and discuss both a little bit. The defendants, and there were many, uh, they had a essentially coordinated defense. So I went to depositions and instead of 20 lawyers, they had a couple. And as a result of that, uh, they coordinated the settlements and all the settlements had very similar language. Uh, that language required that the money that was obtained from the settlements had to be used for MTB cleanup. And so that's what we did in fact do. Now, there's one defendant that didn't settle, ExxonMobil, and they went to trial, and it was an epic trial, three and a half months, and they lost. They lost in Superior Court. They lost in the New Hampshire Supreme Court. They lost in the US Supreme Court. And that's the money that created the trust fund. Now, the trust fund would have gone into the general fund if it wasn't for the vision of Senator Morris and the legislature who decided that uh, New Hampshire would have no credibility going forward if they litigate for something like tobacco settlements and then use the money for something else. 
So the problem was MTB, groundwater contamination, drinking water contamination. The trust fund was created to address those kinds of problems. And to do that, you had to have a statute. That's RSA 45F. That's the statute that governs the uses of the trust fund money. We got a huge deposit, electronic deposit. I tell you, it was pretty exciting seeing the notification that came in uh, June 1st, 2016. And now we have a balance of around $280 million in it. So let's talk about the settlement money. That's distinctly different. It's governed by all of those court orders that were made between the state and the parties that settled. And so those monies have to be used for MTB cleanup only. And I'm talking about settlement money because there may be some confusion, you know, some projects receive settlement money and why are they uh, more generously funded than projects that weren't using settlement money. And what I'm uh, telling you is that they're distinctly different funding sources. And it's different uh, because the settlement money, that stemmed from the state suing on behalf of all the affected citizens and municipalities. And it is governed by those agreements saying MTB cleanup only. So it's just different. So what we've done with the settlement money is we've done a lot of drinking water well sampling. We've done a lot of prevention of contamination to protect the water supplies and the groundwaters of the state. We've investigated and cleaned up sites that are MTB related. And we've uh, done large scale drinking water remedies for MTB contaminated sites. So prevention is something that a lot of states talk about but don't actually put any money into or do the hard work of preventing drinking water sources from getting contaminated. And this program, we had a unique opportunity to do so. So we knew from the research done for the trial that uh, MTB contamination was linked to uh, the density of tank sites that stored gasoline. And we knew that uh, motor vehicle salvage yards had MTB contaminated uh, issues associated with them. And so we developed a program where we've actually removed 260 underground storage tanks, permanently eliminating those potential sources and threats to drinking water wells. We've uh, purchased and provided to motor vehicle recycling facilities over 80 gasoline transfer devices to make sure that they don't have spills of gasoline. And we've put in spill prevention pads at most of the most active salvage yards in the state to control releases of gasoline, to protect drinking water supplies. So New Hampshire's had the opportunity with this funding source to do things other states aren't doing or aren't doing as well, which is to try to protect our drinking water resources. We've collected over 10,000 drinking water samples to identify problems where we know releases are. We've remediated tons of contaminated soil and we've done drinking water infrastructure projects. Uh, this is settlement money. It's different from the trust fund money and I'm just showing you the full scope of activities that we've been able to do because of the lawsuit. This, for example, when I talked about drinking water well sampling, this is a very significant known contamination site in Derry. And the entire uh, colored area is the sampling district that we went and collected data from to fully map out where the contamination is and affecting this part of uh, Derry. So we do sampling districts when we have known problems or suspected problems, and we want our citizens to be protected and to acquire as much knowledge as we can to solve these problems. The salvage yards, I bring this slide up so that you can see some of the activities that we're trying to um, remedy. When I talk about prevention, 
this kind of setup for car dismantling and fluids handling with a little bit of plastic underneath it is going to cause problems, right? This kind of setup where you got the car up above and you hope and pray in the wind that the gasoline makes it into this little uh, whatever, and then the, the five gallon pail underneath, which then you transfer into a storage tank or try to slop into a car. You know that there's gonna be releases from that kind of activities. You've got to educate uh, the yards and through our green yard program, we've been able to do that. But now we're providing the resources so that they actually, once they know what they should do, they can actually do it properly. So that's the old, here's the new, where he can uh, vacuum pump out the gas tank, where it's the gasoline is filtered, it goes into here, and then you just reverse the, the flow from the pumps. And now there's a standard nozzle that you'd see at a gas station that you can put it into a car. So you can immediately reuse the gasoline, you don't store it, and you don't have the opportunity for the re releases of the gasoline affecting our groundwater of the state. And then here, instead of doing something like this over a piece of plastic, here's a high quality concrete pad going into that salvage yard. Infrastructure. There have been situations where MTB contamination has plagued certain communities, and these are some of the projects that are uh, being completed. Uh, millions of dollars are spent uh, extending water lines, providing safe drinking water to the contaminated wells. That's settlement money. I, I want to stress that. That's a different pot of money. That's MTB only. You're here in this workshop today to find out about the trust fund. The trust fund is the other piece of the equation. Everybody else has settled, ExxonMobil didn't. We got a new statute, a new pot of money, $280 million in that uh, available in the trust fund. So that new statute, um, it is broad in its vision and scope of eligible activities giving the advisory commission a lot of flexibility to solve whatever problems occur in New Hampshire in a uniquely New Hampshire way because other states don't have what we've been able to get. So the statute has in its scope infrastructure, the ability to help with, with grants and loans on infrastructure for drinking water. It's got drinking water source protection that's huge to have funding available to protect your vital sources of drinking water. It has the ability, if we find the right need or use, to map contamination statewide. The statute also has the ability to do emergency remedial actions. Say um, a water supply well is, has an imminent threat from some kind of contamination. There's money available for taking emergency action. That's all part of this new statute. And what it does is it sets up an advisory commission that's responsible for the funding decisions and to develop an, a vision for the state on how this opportunity and the funding can be applied. And I think that's really, really important because infrastructure nationally and in so many cases is done in a piecemeal fashion without a vision of what we could do collectively as a state and a nation with our infrastructure. We have funding and we have people tasked to look at the vision for the state and how we could address drinking water infrastructure. I think that's a really great part of the statute. And the advisory commission, they are extremely important, but this is significant funding and there is an important role for the fiscal committee, the legislature and governor and council. They take those approvals from the advisory commission and then fiscal committee approves the budget and governor and council gets involved in the budget and the actual projects. Briefly on the advisory commission, 
It's a 19 member commission. We have some uh, of the representatives here today from the advisory commission. It's chaired by Senator Morris, who gave a brief introduction, ex explained his vision of it. In the short period of time they've existed, the first thing they did is they mapped out, they wanted to, in the short term, prove the concept, get projects going. Um, and so they had a short term goal of getting some grants and loans in place for time critical projects. And then a long term goal of setting up the process going forward with uh, routine annual applications and funding rounds uh, for the trust fund. And for the short term goal, what we were able to accomplish uh, since last fall to now is to approve uh, $13 million in projects and another uh, $30 million today and get those going. And then the application process, we've got that set up in the workshop going on today. And an operating budget for providing resources to, to do all these things. So briefly, the initial projects, um, there's uh, 11 million uh, dollars in grants approved in November, nine projects. And there are public health related priorities, all of them, contaminated water supplies, ongoing projects with funding gaps, uh, lead, in, uh, lead in uh, lines, things like that. And they all had significant municipal funding matches. There were 11 loans that were approved for $23 million. And for the first time, the entire SRF listed uh, list of projects was funded because of this additional money being made available. We also approved uh, collectively the advisory commission and uh, we're the administrative arm to help implement. The advisory commission approved a source water protection project and a statewide water quality sampling project to get good data on the PSC contamination problem plaguing the state. So that was the initial project, that was the kickoff, that was the short-term goal that was accomplished, including projects basically throughout the state. That's where the approved projects were. And the status of those initial projects, we've awarded the $10 million. There's two projects that haven't been awarded yet, but that's, they will be awarded. It's just a question of getting the, the grants ready. We've actually dispersed money from the grants. The Northumberland project is essentially uh, completed and the grant has been dispersed to them for the completion of the project. We've loaned money. We've already issued five loans out of the total uh, corpus of loans for uh, approximately $7 million, plus the TCI loan, which was a separate statute, which is another 5 million dispersed. So loans have been, uh, loan payments have gone out uh, $1.6 million already. Uh, updated today, uh, Sue Carlson uh, now says it's 1.75. So th there's still a tremendous balance in the trust fund as of today. Uh, if you subtract the disbursements to date, you still have approximately the $280 million because you're achieving investment income every month on this trust fund. Uh, the investment uh, income is building over time as they get the investment strategy in place, but already you're getting about $300,000 a month in uh, investment income alone into the trust fund. This is uh, one of the first projects in Colebrook, and it shows you what we can do with this funding. Colebrook had 70% water loss in their system. They had lead service lines uh, all up and down here, you know, that were uncovered when they were doing their water main replacement. And they really didn't have a good idea on their water loss because their water meters needed replacement. So these are types of infrastructure problems that we can tackle now that we have new funding. Problems that should have been addressed many years ago, but now we should and can. 
So anyway, uh, wrapping up, uh, so you can have a different speaker. Uh, we're on to a uh, discussion of the application process for this year. And the next speakers, uh, we have Jana and Rick Skorinka. Both have been associated for years with the SRF program. Uh, most, of them, most of you probably know them. And what they're going to do is they're going to go into the nuts and bolts. You know, you know how we got here and how we have more money than anybody else in the nation. Now they'll talk about the process to apply for and to obtain these grants and loans and help. Uh, Rick and John. You know, good morning. My name is Rick Skarenka, and uh, I've been with the Bureau for 27 years now. And, and one of the things I, I, I want to do, I think it's important to put things in perspective. Uh, over my career, there's been several events what I consider game changers, uh, one of which was in the 1990s, uh, the uh, adoption of the surface water treatment rule, uh, which essentially required all unfiltered surface water to be treated. And that, that really <clears throat> provided an uh, improved public health protection across the country. Another game changer happened in, in 96 with the readoption of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, where they created a new drinking water state revolving loan program, essentially, which was a uh, response to the uh, by the federal government for an uh, what were they what the what the water industry considered an unfunded federal mandate because of all the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Well, uh, who here has benefited? Uh, raise their hand from the SRF. Raise their hand. It's quite a few. Well, essentially. <laughs> As far as I'm concerned, everyone should raise their hand because everyone here has benefited, whether directly or indirectly, from the state uh, drinking water state revolving loan program. Today, I consider the what we call what I'm calling the trust fund another game changer for my career, and it should be for yours. Uh, this uh, new program, thanks to the Senator Morris and the legislature, uh, has the ability to provide an additional capital financing program not only for public drinking water supplies, but other stakeholders involved with drinking water and public health protection. Yeah. For the rest of this uh, program, I'm going to talk about some general program information. Uh, you will hear uh, perhaps uh, the same thing that is fed by Clark, or excuse me, by Senator Morris, and also by Clark and Gary. But I think it's important. Uh, the messaging here is uh, is consistent, uh, and you may hear something three or four times, but. Uh, that's a, a very important point to be taken away. Uh, John is going to talk uh, after me about the specific pre-application, and that's a little different than the normal DWS application. We are joining uh, the programs essentially with a common pre-application, and then she's also going to talk about the timeline uh, going forward for this fiscal year. It's important for everyone to understand that there is a difference between the SRF and the trust fund. The trust, the DWSRF is a federal state partnership which provides financing to public water systems to protect public health, compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act, and make water more affordable. The, tr the trust fund provides for the protection, preservation, and enhancement of drinking water and groundwater resources in New Hampshire. The trust fund language captures a much broader audience than the DWS. Uh, I please note that the DWS is administered by DES and the trust fund is overseen by the advisory commission. However, DES provides support for the advisory commission.
to put things in perspective, I want to paint a picture of where we've been with the DWS and where we are now, and how long it's taken to get to where we are. Uh, as I said, the DWSRF was adopted in 96 and implemented in 97. And since that time, uh, the, the current portfolio has accumulated over $300 million uh, in loans. Uh, this, this was implemented uh, to the benefit of both municipal and privately owned public water systems. DES has administered over 260 projects ranging from less than $50,000 to over $9 million uh, to the city of Dover. In addition, and probably more important, the DWS has provided over $20 million in principal forgiveness. I note the number on the right-hand side for the trust fund is $276 million, which is not very far off from the $300 million, which has taken over 20 years to accomplish for the DWSRF. For this current round of funding for construction projects, we estimate there will be approximately $7.3 million available from the DWSRF and approximately $50 million available from the trust fund. Again, there will be a common application for both programs and later in the program, John will provide detailed information about that. As Clark mentioned earlier, both of these funding programs are primarily loan programs with the DWSRF continuing to provide principal forgiveness to those applicants that qualify and the trust fund providing an opportunity for grant funds. Both funding programs will be administered through the DWS and essentially mimic the current DWS program, which provides for both interim financing and long-term debt at the interest rate locked in at the time of entering the loan. We want to remind everyone that this is a reimbursement program and so where you must incur costs and seek reimbursement afterwards. The DWS is essentially a low interest loan program. The interest rate is calculated using the Levin Geo Bond Index um, at the time of, uh, for the DWS program. The interest rate is discounted based upon that 11 GO bond index. For example, a 20 year term loan is discounted 80% and a 10 year term loan is discounted 50%. The established 11 GO bond index is set and the, the, stake, the information shown here is taken from last week's 11 GO bond index, which is 3.34. And you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the, the discounts for the SRF. Stakeholder feedback recommended not applying federal conditions to the trust fund loans and grants. Based on that feedback, federal conditions do not apply to the trust funds loans. Again, this is mentioned before, but this is an important point to make. However, for trust fund loans, the interest rate will not be discounted and will be the 11 GO bond index with the same rate for all term loans. I do want to point out that the DWSRF can extend out to 30 years for disadvantaged water systems and the trust fund loans can extend out to 40 years. However, both funding programs uh, are, uh, the asset being funded must have at least the life expectancy of the term of the loan. For example, if you're refinancing meters, uh, you shouldn't be going any, anywhere over 20 years. If you're installing a storage tank, the expected life of the storage tank is well over 40 years. So that could be, that term 40 years would be acceptable to the bad asset. Grants are available through the trust fund. Grants are available through the trust fund. As mentioned before, uh, these grants will be based upon information provided by the applicants, including what other funding sources are being leveraged, the need for the project, benefits of the project, for both public health protection, economic development, and perhaps job growth. The amount of grant offered 
will be determined by the advisory commission. For this round of funding, the DWRS will continue to offer principal forgiveness in accordance with the 2018 intended use plan. Under the IUP, applicants will may qualify for principal forgiveness on whether the medium household income is less than the statewide average, and then we calculate the affordability index, which is the projected water rate divided by the medium household income. And across the state, uh, the medium household income ranges from a low of 28,000 to a high of 131,000. So you can see there's quite a range in the medium household income. Uh, last year, the principal for forgiveness started at 10% with a range up to 20%, and we anticipate the same range to occur for this year's program. For the DWS, any community and non-transient non-profit water system is eligible to apply for the program. The trust fund provides for similar applicants. However, the statute for the trust fund recognizes applicants not normally eligible for the SRF. For example, a municipality that does not have a municipal water system can apply to the trust fund. I will note that individuals uh, cannot apply on their own to the trust fund. Eligible projects for the DWS are the typical water infrastructure improvements ranging from source development to water meter replacement. The language in the statute for the trust fund allows expanded eligibility uh, for the trust fund program. Again, it's been, it's been mentioned before, but that's in a very important part of difference between the DWSRF and the trust fund. Construction projects eligible for the trust fund may include improvements related to growth and economic development. Also, projects that address emerging contaminants such as 1,4-dioxane and PFAS are eligible. Improvements to dams related to public water supplies are eligible under the trust fund. Historically, dam improvements have not been eligible under the SRF according to the federal requirements. All construction projects funded with any DWSRF funds are subject to federal cross cutters, including Davis-Bacon prevailing wage rates and American Iron and Steel provisions. The trust fund loans and grants are not subject to, to Davis-Bacon and IIS provisions. However, both programs will need to have an environmental review performed before construction begins. In addition, asset management has become an important component of water system sustainability, and that will be conditioned under both programs. At this point, I'd like to bring Jonna up and she can go through and, and uh, do a comprehensive review of the pre-application. Any questions? Uh, we have questions uh, session at the very end, but just any quick questions. Uh, I will note that this is being broadcast uh, on a web live on the web. So pre please watch your language if you do speak. All right. Uh, question. I get it, and I am going to repeat the question. Yes, the question was, if you get an SRF loan and a grant from the trust fund, does the grant funding uh, con include cross federal cross creditors? Yes, because any if it's related specifically to the same project, any dollar that's involved that's from a SRF program, the whole project is subject to the federal cross creditor conditions. The question is, are the loans on a fixed rate basis or are they adjustable? The loan interest rate is locked in at the time of the loan closing, which is the very beginning of the project. It is a fixed rate uh, and 
I, I, if it goes, if at the end of the project for the SRF program, if at the end of the project, the interest rate is actually lower at that point in time, then you get a benefit of the lower rate. But essentially it's a fixed rate uh, loan. question is, again, if you have a separate SRF project that was closed out and you start a, a phase two, for example, or, or um, another project uh, with grant funds, uh, are they, uh, is that eligible to federal cross cutters? And the answer is no, if it's a separate project. Great, thank you very much, Jonna. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, get into the details of how to apply. We have the pre-application available, starts today. This is, if you open up your folders, you should have the pre-application in there. I'll give you a second to pull that out, and we're just going to walk through that. So this is one form for the drinking water SRF and the trust fund. You just apply once, you don't have to worry about what funding it's coming from. It's also one form for loans and grants. We'll go through the loan portion in the beginning and there is a section in the back for the grant. Sorry. So right now, the pre-app is available in Word format. We are working on an online form. We were hoping to have it ready today. Everybody's been working really hard at lots of things. So it's just not ready yet. When it is ready, we will send out a link for that. It's an online form you would register through the, the state website. But I would like to spend a minute to show you the online form so you be, can be familiar with it and I can show you kind of what it's gonna look like once it comes out. <coughs> Just bear with me, I have to set this up. Basically what this is, is uh, statewide, we're trying to get online forms available. And you'll need to register and create an account like you do for lots of websites all over, whatever you're trying to do online. And you may have seen this recently, Luis Adorno from the Drinking Water Groundwater Bureau did an asset management web uh, database. And so that's an online form. Some of you may are, has anybody seen that? Was anybody involved in checking that out? So some of you are familiar with this online system. So to register, we'd send you the link to this. And you, if you don't already have an account, you would sign up for one. And you just right here on the top, you register, you put in your name, you set up a password. And what will happen is next is you'll get an email and it'll, it wants you to verify your account. So you just follow the instructions on the email and then you're all set up and ready to go. You may want to set that up now so that when the pre when it is available online, you can do so. Right now we do have the word version up on the website so you can download it um, as of today. And I'll show you how to get that also. One of the benefits from doing this online form is that it will save your information year after year. So next year, when you wanna apply for something new, you can copy the form and it'll have a lot of the same information. It'll pre-populate some of the, your, um, your name and email and stuff like that. So it'll be a little bit easier each year to year and you can see what you sent in last year. OK, 
Okay. We're gonna strongly recommend that once it's available, you do use the online form. Basically what we have to do is get all this information from your applications and we put it into Excel spreadsheet and we've got to process all that information. So a lot of times, so if you do have a word version, we will certainly accept that. You do have between now until June 15th to submit a pre-app. So if you want to wait, that's fine. A lot of people wait. We're going to ask, don't wait till the last minute to submit your pre-app. <laughs> So for those of you that are familiar with the Drinking Water SRF pre-app, this is going to be different than what you're used to. I'm going to go through the pre-app so you can see what is expected. So if you look on the first page, the first part is really just basic applicant information. Put in a contact person, who we can call if we have questions about the pre-app. We also ask for the median household income, as Rick mentioned, the MHI, and the water rate. We ask for those two items because on the SRF side of things, we need those in, that information to determine if you're uh, eligible for principal forgiveness. So we do have a list of the MHIs that we're going to use, and that's on the SRF website. I'll show you how to get that later, and it'll have a town your town and what the MHI is. So if you don't know, you can use this list and put that number in there. Is anybody here that is from a very small system? Maybe condo associations, so we have a few folks here. So for the MHI, you could put in the town, we can start for that, unless you've recently done an income survey. If you have an income survey, you can use that information. If you haven't had an income survey done, we can certainly do that and we have a technical assistance provider that can do that for free. And you don't need to do that before the pre-app. We can do that once, if you find out that your project has been selected for funding, then we can go ahead and do the income survey for that. The, and as far as the water rate for small systems, sometimes it's one lump sum condo fee. You will have to pull that out, the actual cost for water in that water rate. That's what we're looking for there. Section 1.2 is the funding request. So this is where we're look, you're going to put in your loan and grant funds. How much do you need to borrow? Do you need a grant to get the project done? You also need to include additional funds that you're bringing to the table for your project. And you'll list those out in section 2.2. So that last line there that says other funds contributing to the project, that's if you have your own local funds, maybe you have a CDBG grant, Anything else that you're bringing to the table, you'd put in there. Section 1.3 is just, this is your project information. What are you proposing to do? Are you doing, we have, we can fund design only. We we do some of those. Or if it's design construction, one big project, we can certainly do that. We're just asking you to check that off. And you're going to put in your summary of your project. What are you looking to do? And if you flip the page, you're going to put in your purpose and need. Basically, what is the justification and need for the project? Why do you have to get it done? And the next section talks about public health protection. Your project may or may not address a public health issue, but if it does, certainly list that information in the box below. The next section is, We'd like to know if there are additional benefits that the project will provide to the system beyond the basic benefits. And I think what I forgot to say was the reason we're asking for so much information is because DES, we review these every year. We are very familiar with your system. But what's different here is that the advisory commission is going to get all this information and they need to make their decision. So they need to know a lot more about your system. So that's why we're asking for all this additional information so they can make an informed decision. So be informative on these pre-apps, but be brief. Uh, you don't need to send pages and pages of information. However, if you do have maybe an asset management plan, you can certainly send that separately to, to go with your application. So back to that section, this is, so this is looking at additional benefits beyond the basic benefits of doing your project. So Maybe the project itself isn't necessarily providing any of those additional benefits on its own, but maybe your system has been doing a lot of improvements in these different categories. 
if something doesn't apply in these categories, starting with energy efficiency or anywhere in this application, or if you don't know, call us, you can just put NA or simply state that there are no additional benefits. Maybe if you're a small system or if you're a municipal system that's maybe going through, you know, you haven't been able to make as many improvements as some of the larger systems. Um, it doesn't mean that your improvements that you have done aren't important. Maybe you've done a leak detection cert. Maybe the small system you have just completed a business plan for your system. So certainly include those things, no, how, no matter how small you may think they may be. It's basically your time to shine. And for those systems or, and these are more for construction projects, maybe not municipalities that are looking to do something a little different. If you aren't that shiny of a system and you're really not in a, in a good state, this could be your first step in getting there and just state that on the pre-app. That's the information we're looking for. So I'm gonna go through and just give a couple of examples of maybe what we're looking for in these categories. And like I said, this could be for the project itself, or maybe you recently completed a project that in these that have these benefits. So for energy efficiency, um, will you be installing, or maybe you re recently installed some new efficient pumps or motors or VFD variable frequency drives? Maybe you've just conducted an energy audit, and this project was listed on there as um, something you wanted to implement. Maybe you're putting in efficient lighting in the pump house that you're constructing. Maybe you installed solar panels. Maybe you're using porous pavement, things like that. For water efficiency, meter installation or upgrades. Maybe you're upgrading your meters, maybe doing leak repair. You're replacing water main. Maybe it's been identified in a water conservation plan. Maybe you're installing or retrofitting plumbing devices water to make them water use water efficient devices. For source water protection, does your system have a source water protection plan? Are you working on local ordinances to protect drinking water in your town? Maybe you've installed fencing around your wells for security purposes as source protection. On the next page, we get into asset management. As Rick mentioned, while all these categories are important, asset management is particularly important because not only is it a requirement of borrowing the funds, but it shows that you'll have a system in place to maintain those assets for the future. And we're helping to invest in those. So that's what we wanna make sure that they are maintained. So does your system have an asset management program? If so, tell us a little bit about it. If you don't, do you have plans to start one? Even if it's the basics, beginning just starting with your asset inventory. Have you received an asset management grant from the Drinking Water Bureau? Put that information down. Do you have buy-in at all levels for asset management operations from decision makers, commissioners, your decision makers, all the way down to operations? For the next category, sustainability and resiliency. Basically, is your system resilient, meaning can it withstand and recover from natural and man-made disasters how fast can it get back online once you've been affected by maybe floods or power outages? So have you made any mitigation or adaptation um, measures at your system to address extreme weather events? Does your project address a critical asset? Are you putting in additional sources for redundancy purposes? Are you purchasing generators for backup power? Are you re relocating facilities or equipment above flood flood levels. The next section, economic impact. This isn't typically an SRF category, but the advisory commission is looking for information. If your project does have an economic impact, please include that. Will it create more business? Not only will it create some short-term jobs, are there any long-term jobs that will come out of this project? Maybe you're doing a water line extension to a new area or increasing your storage capacity to, to handle new business. The proof of thoroughness category, this is sort of just to make sure this, is it a well thought out project? Did it just, you pull it out of a hat or have it, did it come out of an asset management plan or a capital improvement plan? Is it a project that needs to get done but just can't seem to get voter approval every year? We just wanna make sure that it, it's, it's, it's a good project. The innovation category, this may not apply to most projects, but if you do have a unique project, 
definitely that's what we're looking for there. For example, Manchester Waterworks is doing the riverbank infiltration on the Merrimack River project, and that is very unique. It's the only one in New England. So um, don't worry you have, if you have to put NA, water main replacement is not innovative, <laughs> but necessary. So moving on to the next section, this is where we're looking at your investment in your utility, past and future. So here we're just having you describe a little bit about the money that you've put into your system over the past uh, five years. And there's a chart. You can fill out, you can add lines if you need extra space. You don't feel like you have to fill every line out, but we are just looking in this, for these infrastructure investments, we're looking for water and wastewater, trying to figure out from the water sector side what you've been investing in or what you want to invest in. So in the, you'll list your, past projects, and then some future projects, things that are on your list to do in addition to the one you're asking funding for. So maybe in the next two to five years, are there some big projects that you have lined up, what the estimated amount is and what year you hope to do that. Then we get into listing any, your current debt. Do you have any other outstanding loans maybe um, with, Clean water SRF, drinking water SRF, maybe rural development or um, other funding sources. We do have, well, I'll wait to introduce them. So moving on to section two, this is all about the project costs and how you plan to pay for the project. So 2.1 just has you break out in general what the costs are for construction and engineering and put in a little bit contingency. So be conservative. It's very important to ask for the correct amount. We know that a lot of times projects cost more than we think they do. And you only pay back what you borrow. So you might wanna ask for a little bit more and then hopefully the project doesn't cost that much and you only have to pay back what you borrow. In the past, through the SRF program, you have a project, you're in the middle of getting it started, the bids come back high. Sometimes, a lot of the times, we've been able to provide more money and we could amend those loans. The difference at this point is the SRF funds are a little tighter. We don't have as much excess funding on the SRF side to just amend loans as problems come up. So just be conservative with your number. And then on the trust fund side, we can't make that decision um, in-house like we can with SRF where we can just modify a loan. The trust fund would have to, you'd have to wait. The timing will probably be off and the advisory commission has to approve that. So just be careful in that spot. If you, you know, if you decide you think the project's going to be three million and maybe we get further along, we haven't put a loan in place and you think it's, you're okay with asking for 2.5, we can certainly <coughs> lower that amount before we enter into any loan documents. Underneath that total is what your project costs are based on. We're just trying to get a sense of where you're coming at for numbers, such are they quotes, are they engineers estimates? So just that's what that box we're looking for there. Section 2.2 are funding sources. So this is what I talked about on the first page where you have to list that total of other money you're bringing to the table. This would be your local funds, any other, uh, if you have a CDBG grant, community development block, block grant. I saw Mina here, She's, there's Mina. So Mina, we have a couple funding partners here with Eric. Eric from Rural Development. Both of those programs we work very closely with and we do a lot of joint projects um, together. So list any of those funding sources. And then we just wanna know if they're secured or not. Maybe you've just applied and you don't have the money in place. Maybe you've applied for the community development block grant and you just haven't heard on the determination for that. So that's that last box secured, yes or no. And then on the next page is your funding plan. If any of those sources are not secured, you're gonna just put that information in there and when you anticipate that to happen. If you've asked for a grant from the advisory commission, what is your backup plan if the grant is denied or they only fund possibly a portion of the grant? So are you gonna to need to borrow the rest of those funds? So we need you to have kind of plan B, a backup plan, how that shortfall will be addressed. 
Section 2.3 is just the project schedule, your best guess at when you anticipate your project to start. This round of, pro this round of applications for 2018, we're basically looking at construction for 2019. We need you to have some expenditures 2019, late 2019 at least. You could be doing construction in 2020. But if you have a project that isn't even gonna start till 2021, we're gonna ask that you wait. We really are trying to get more shovel ready projects, um, but we do know that projects take a lot longer than we all think they do. <laughs> we find that all the time. So within reason, we want stuff to be moving along in the next year or two. If you have something that's going to be longer, you just you should wait. The other part of that that we're asking for is the date, the authority to borrow or accept grant funds. Sometimes we need to wait until next uh, spring for another town meeting for some communities to get approvals. So the section three is important. This is the grant request. If you are requesting grant funds from the trust fund, this is where you need to explain the justification and the need for the grant. You really need to show the advisory commission that all other funding sources have been exhausted and this grant is needed as the last piece of the funding puzzle to get the job done. Make your case here. If you feel like you need a grant, this is your spot to, to explain why. You may not wanna raise your rates. Your rates are already high and you really need to this project and you need the grant in order to not have to raise the rates. If you have rates that are really, really low and you don't wanna raise them because you haven't raised them in 20 years, that's probably not a good justification. Make sure you have realistic rates. Um, Luis in the back can <laughs> help you with rates. So that's an, an important piece. And the last box is basically just signing off. Uh, it, it can be any, anybody could sign the pre-app as long as you're have approval to do so, you're authorized to do so. It could be the town manager, it could be the water operator, it could be an engineer. So from our perspective, anybody can sign this as long as you were given the go ahead to, to do that. This question may come up is, do you do multiple pre-apps? Or can I just do one big pre-app if I have three projects? You can submit as many pre-apps as you want. If you have maybe two kinds of projects that are very different that are on two different timelines. Maybe you're putting in a new well and then you're doing some water main. The water main is going to move a lot faster so we probably better to do two different pre-apps. If you're doing maybe a storage tank and some water lines you could do that as one pre-app because the timeline's about the same. So you know if you have any questions on on that just let us know and we can kind of talk about it and figure out what the best the best way to approach that is. Does anybody have any questions on that before I move on? Yes. Uh, for estimating the funding and the fact that one of these follows the health federal regulations and steel and iron, the other doesn't, I think that has an impact on costs. So would we just go with the highest possible cost and put that number in? So the question is, because trust fund money does not have federal cost cutters, but SRF does, when you're estimating the funding cost, should you go with the higher amount? If you end up being funded with SRF money, yes. I would go with the higher amount because we will determine what's funded with SRF monies first. So I'll get into that a little bit more and how we're gonna rank them and what that will look like. But yes, if you're looking, if you're not sure what number to put in, assume you will have federal cross cutters be safer. Yes. Uh, one question. Uh, this is a free application form. My question is, is there another form that will be followed up after that? <laughs> Real application form? Or so the question is, is it the only form? No. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, we talked about the pre-app. Is there more forms, a more formal application? The answer is yes. And I will explain the whole process, the big picture. But yes, this is just the first step. Yes. There was mention of um, seeking reimbursement for projects that have already been completed. How far back do we go to seek reimbursement for projects that have already been completed? There is no reimbursement for previously completed right. projects. The, the 
goal with this round is to only apply to projects that are going to happen, not those that have been completed. The commission was pretty firm on that. So the question is, how far back can you go for reimbursement purposes? We are not funding any projects that have already been completed. The reimbursement part, I will clarify in a little bit, because I think there might have been a little bit of confusion, because I think what Rick was talking about was a little different. So hopefully that will finish answering your question. Yes. Yes. And yep. So the question is, will we rank the project and list them out? Yes. And I will show that in a future slide. All right. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Do you want? I'll take one last question, and then I'll run through. And it might answer some other questions. Okay, so the question was, is there a standard uh, contingency amount to put in for construction costs? Rick? 10%. 10%, yeah, 10 percent is typical. Okay, so I'll move along and maybe some of the other questions will be answered as I go through. So after June 15th, we are going to review and rank all the preamps for the loan portion only. based on the SRF ranking criteria for loan funds, and we'll determine which projects are eligible for forgiveness. The top, the top ranked projects will be funded with loan funds first, up to the amount that we have available. We will call this, as we always have, the project priority list, the PPL. Then the whole list will be forwarded to the advisory commission for their review and selection of the trust fund loans and grants. Here is our PPL. This is our this is a sample, and yes, I understand it is very hard to see. But what I'm trying to sh just show you is more color codes and in, in the ranking in general. Um, this has each project listed in the order of how they're ranked using the SRF criteria, as I mentioned. This criteria is listed in our intended use plan. The intended use plan is some a plan that we have to develop every year for our federal funds that come in from EPA to basically say how we're going to use all the money. So that is available to the public. We do have public review on that, and it is available on our website. So this list includes the loan amount. So we have the, the projects here. Mind your way. The projects in the first column. What the loan request is and what the grant request is. So this first portion, what we're gonna do is we have to use our federal money first to maintain the integrity of that program. So you don't have to worry about what you're gonna get. Ultimately, we have to decide and we will offer you what we can offer you and you can decide whether you wanna move forward or not. The blue is gonna be the SRF. So as these are ranked in order based on total score of our ranking, we figure out how much money we have available in loan funds. We get to that bottom. So where the blue stops is we ran out of SRF money. We will forward this whole list to the advisory commission. They can take our ranking into consideration and then take the other information from the pre-app into consideration and make their decisions. The money in purple, the projects in purple are what the trust fund can fund, what they've selected and then maybe they ran out of money. What Clark, as Clark had mentioned, this grant amount, they will look at, for the grants, they'll start with the SRF ranked projects first, figure out which grant monies they can or decide to give out, and then they'll move down to this other portion that they're funding with trust fund loan. So we may not have enough, or we may have enough money to fund everything. There's also this category at the bottom. These are the ineligible projects for SRF that Rick mentioned that we cannot fund no matter what, so we won't rank those. We'll drop them into a different category and the advisory commission can take it from there. We know with the pre-apps, there's no commitment. If your project doesn't move forward, that's okay. You might not get voter approval in the spring. If that happens, or you're just not ready for whatever reason, you can say, we're declining funding. Thank you anyways. That's why it's better if you have project ready projects to submit. So that doesn't necessarily happen, but it, but it can. 
and those projects drop out and then they would turn to white and what we would do is just offer funds to other people on the list that didn't get selected for funding. So currently sometimes, like last year with the SRF program, well the trust fund showed up and was able to help us out with all those, but in years past we would drop out at the top and we would sometimes be able to offer funds to everybody on our list. So that's okay. Um, so now into the, the process here. So this is that big picture process. Here you are way at the top. We're just getting started. We do the pre-application and I'll go over timeline next. We're gonna rank them all, figure out who's gonna get selected. Then if you get selected, you move to the final application process. So it's a whole different thing, but we're gonna ask for different kinds of stuff, different forms, <laughs> more forms, but different. Basically, we need those to get a loan in place. So after that, we get a final application, we get a loan documents developed, we send them to you, we get them signed. They go to, for trust fund loans, they go to fiscal first, then governor and council. SRF funded loans will go directly to governor and council. If you're a privately owned water system, we do have to have a separate loan closing. So the documents are a little bit different, but essentially the process is the same. Then you start, you're doing your design, your construction, you finish your project, and then you start repayment. So repayments start one year after project, after substantial completion. And they are annually for municipal systems or municipalities, and they are monthly for privately owned systems. Um, I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anything. So for, for the disbursements, once we have a loan in place, then you can start requesting to be reim, for a reimbursement. If, so for example, if we have, if you apply for a project this spring and you need to start on the design, there's no guarantee that you'll get the loan. So the risk is there, but if you do any engineering, non-construction related activities, and then you get the loan in place in December or January, we can reimburse those non-construction costs for that project. You cannot start construction until environmental review is done and the loan documents are in place. So we, that's where we can't reimburse for work already completed because you shouldn't be starting work until we have those things in place. It's just the engineering we can pay for if it's getting started before. Okay, and as far as this part of the second phase of this whole process, we have an SRF workshop later this fall where we're gonna talk, where we would get into more of those details of the process. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that workshop after this. So we get into the timeline. So when is all of this gonna happen? So starting today, the pre-apps are available, as I said, they're due June 15th. I keep saying that to remind you. The week of June 16th to July 23rd, we will spend all that time reviewing and ranking pre-apps. So that the week of July 23rd, the goal is, is to have our draft PPL, our project priority list. That will go out to all Anybody that submitted a pre-application, so you can see what the results are. And then we will forward that list to the advisory commission. Drinking Water SRF has to have a public comment period on that PPO and a public hearing to solicit any comments on it. The hearing for that is August 2nd and the public comment period ends on August 16th. So that's why we have this little time frame where we have to wait. If people have issues with how their project was ranked for the SRF, they can come and give us comments on that. Once that's closed, we consider on the SRF side of things, the list to be final. In the meantime, the advisory commission will be spending August, hopefully before October, but depends on how things go, that we would know by then what projects they've selected. So then at that point, we would notify you formally in a letter saying you've been a approved for funding for an SRF loan at these rates, or you've been approved for a trust fund loan at these rates, these conditions then you can decide. And you have from that point forward all the way until next June, 
to submit the final application part. Sometimes, as I mentioned, you have to go to town hall meeting that following spring to even get the vote. If you already have your vote of authority to borrow funds, maybe you have it already, you can move ahead and we can get loan documents in place right away. The earliest we could possibly probably get loan, loan documents in place is November would be really pushing it, I think, um, but we can, we can try. So just so you have some sort of idea, just the timing of things, the soonest we could do that. Moving on to key points. We went through a lot of stuff this morning, and I just wanted to recap a couple key points. This is, as Clark mentioned, the process for this year, for 2018. If we need to improve things, I'm sure we do. Um, it may change based on how this year goes. So we'll definitely take any comments <laughs> into consideration. And we're gonna learn al along the way, really. This is primarily a loan program, as you've heard many times today. Be on the PPL. Basically, if you think you have a project, it's better to be on the project priority list and submit a pre-app than not to. You don't wanna realize six months from now, you have a project you need to get done and you have to wait a whole nother year till next summer to even get this process started. So get on the list and then you could say no if it doesn't move ahead. DES makes decisions on only SRF. The advisory commission makes decisions on the trust fund loans and grants. But either way, we are having those programs work together as closely as we can. We've had that SRF program in place for a very long time. It's successful and we wanna mirror that. And so we don't want them to compete against each other. We don't want trust fund or SRF to compete against the other valuable funding sources out there like CDBG and rural development. So we're just trying to work together. So when you start doing the pre-app and you have questions, and you need help, <laughs> who do you call? So we are here, feel free to call us. I did wanna, I'm gonna show you the website for a second. We're still gonna end early, don't worry. So this is the Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund. I realize you can't see it, but if you go under the des.nh.gov website, go under the A to Z list under grants and loans, you will find a link directly to the SRF program. And this is where you can find the pre-app right now, the Word version. You can find last year's project priority list, our intended use plan. As soon as we, we are working on the one for 2018, it will come out this summer. That will be posted. And then your, right down here is your MHI, the median household income sheet if you need to look, look that up. And also down below, once you get to the point of selected projects, this is where all your other forms are for your final application. Then we have the new trust fund website, which is very nice. And here you can find out more about the trust fund program and the advisory commission, what their mission is. We are trying to put as much information as we can on this website as quickly as possible. There's just a lot going on. You can go under current projects. Gary showed you what projects were from the initial funding round. You can check those out. You can go to the applicants and recipients tab, and that's where you will find either construction or non-construction. So I know Paul Suska is gonna talk this afternoon about the land conservation, non-construction projects. So this is where you would find the pre-app, the program guidelines, all the documents that you have in your folder. And we'll be adding to that, as I mentioned. Okay. Another option for assistance with the pre-apps, we have technical assistance providers such as, where's Kathy Rogers in the back. She's the New Hampshire representative for RCAP Solutions. She can certainly, we can get, if you wanna see Rick or I, we can connect you with Kathy at the end or at any time in the process. We also have Granite State Rural Water. Anybody from Granite State Rural Water here? There. So we have Granite State can certainly help. Um, provide assistance with pre-apps questions are great. 
So, this workshop, as you know, is being recorded. If you know someone that couldn't be here and they want to listen in at their convenience, we will have the links on the website. Or if you thought this was such an awesome presentation that you'd like to listen to it all over again, you can do that. <coughs> Through the New Hampshire Municipal Association, we're gonna have a condensed version of key points from this workshop on a webinar on May 16th from 12 to one, so you could listen to that too. And as I mentioned, we will also have our annual SRF workshop. This is joint with Clean Water. This is on October 16th. And this is will be good timing because you would know by then, at that point, hopefully, whether your projects have been selected, and then you could attend this workshop to really get into the details of the next steps of the process. For contacts, so myself, if you can't read this, find one of us if you need our numbers or emails. I can answer questions on the pre-app, loan administration paperwork. Rick can answer questions on technical assistance, engineering side of things. We do have a new administrator for the trust fund, Erin Holmes. She could not be here today. She's at another training, but she'll be starting as soon as we can get her started. <laughs> and then Gary, who is, Gary um, is the MTBE Bureau Administrator. If you have any questions, if you had some um, questions about maybe an MTBE contamination project. Um, please be patient. Things are moving very quickly. There's a lot of pieces to a new program of this size and we're trying to make it as smooth as possible. So just bear with us. If, if there's a problem, let us know and we'll try to work it out. So are there other questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, if you submit a pre-application, it doesn't have all the information on it, how will we handle that? Will we just drop them to the bottom of the list or would we contact the applicant to let them know to fill out more information? I would say put your best foot forward right away because we're gonna have so, we anticipate so many pre-applications that I don't think we wanna spend our time trying to go back to applicants after June 15th. However, if they're not gonna to drop to the bottom of the list, we're gonna rank the SRF projects. We used to do pre-apps that were three pages long with not a lot of information. It was, it's based on public health and other criteria. So those don't necessarily drop to the bottom. If it's an important project, it, it might rank high anyways on the SRF side. So that's not necessarily the case. If we, Possibly if we see it come in maybe, and we know, we know you're doing a lot more stuff. You know, I just can't promise that. Can I ask sure. So one of the key things on that question is, even if you get ranked as project 21 of 21, the commission is gonna make decisions with the trust fund dollars. If they look at your project and you've got lead pipe, but you did a really bad job of describing it. You didn't fill in anything else in the application, but they recognize this is a town that's drinking water through lead pipe. They may decide to put it at the top of the funding, even though it's at the bottom of the ranking. The commission has the ability to do that. That's where the SRF loans are so different. Those are run under a federal grant program. They're federal dollars. We write up a plan. The federal government agrees to that plan and DES runs that plan. And that's why those are going to be put first, completed first, and handed to the commission for review first. Then it's our money inside the state and we make our own rules. Um, to give credit to Jana, I don't think she gives herself enough credit. When we first set up to do this, they set up a subcommittee to come up with how we're gonna run this process. And the goal was, hey, in 18 months, it'd be great if we could get a next round of funding started. We're six months later and you're sitting here with a pretty decent presentation that gives you a pretty good feel on how this is gonna happen. Is there a webinar set up? They've done a ton of work to come up with something that is as close to SRF as possible, so it's similar to the experience you've seen before, but it gives you the chance to put your best foot forward. There's a ton of descriptors in there for you to write up why yours is the best project on the face of the planet, most of which do not apply to federal dollars. So they've never had anything to do with these programs before. And Jana and Rick and Paul this afternoon have come up with a methodology for you to put that best foot forward. 
if you don't do that, I don't mean to be harsh, but it's not their job to go do your work for you. They will present whatever you put into it in the best light and give it the best of uh, acknowledgement and evaluation. But they've really scrambled to pull this together and things like your economic assessment, that's a qualitative and we don't do qualitative assessments. So if you didn't write it up very well, we're not gonna go in and try and fix it for you. It's really up to you to put your project's best foot forward, explain why your project is important and how it really benefits the state. They will do a great job in pulling that together and giving you all the credit that you've earned and getting it to the commission with the clearest explanation they can. But it's really up to you to put your project forward. You know, we all took creative writing in high school. Now's the time to take advantage of that learning. Okay. Lots of questions. I'll just take, now I'll come to you. Go ahead. Um, the, I don't know, it's kind of this wall thing. How the grant versus the, the welding is, is driving us primarily along the line, but how, how, what percentage grant do you anticipate that's going to be, and how will that fall into the ranking versus the SRF? Right. The, sorry, I put the microphone up. <laughs> the only parts that are known are the SRF and that's the principal forgiveness, and that ranged from 10 to 20%, as was brief before. That's the only grant that is any way guaranteed to anybody in any way. The commission can make up their own mind. The ground rules that we've heard from them is they're certainly not gonna go above a 50% grant unless it's an emergency need situation. Again, you're digging up your roads and you suddenly find everybody's living on lead pipe and nobody had an idea. They might do a very rich grant in that their unique case, but it'd be an emergency, not part of the normal application. To date, it's been a 25% grant is the average. Um, the goal is to get to LCHIP, which is one in seven. So it's about a 14 to 15% grant. Um, the further we can switch that, the longer these funds can go and the greater the reach and the number of projects that can be given a benefit to give you some history, we've had the state aid grant program, which has run at about 20%. That's the richest, most beneficial program the state has ever run. So far, the track record here is we're above that. And the goal is not to become, uh, give it all the way in the first two years. So the commission has kept absolute flexibility. You can pitch anything you want. And that's one of the things I, I wrote a note and I meant to say last time I got up here. You can propose anything you want. You can propose I want a 100% grant because I want bigger pipe in the ground because I think bigger pipe is better. You can apply that. Uh, the commission has got some pretty smart people who really know their water systems. I'm looking at a couple of them right here. They know what you really need. And if you're applying for something that you don't need and you have the ability to pay for it without the state, you're not gonna do well in the competition. And that's one of the big things Senator Morse brought up at the beginning. To some degree, this is a competition. We're gonna put a certain amount of money on the table every year and the projects that give the best explanation, put the best match, you know, hit all the criteria the best are gonna get funded. And when we run out of funding, the projects that fall below that line are not gonna get funded. And it's really up to you to come up with it. The things that they've really stressed, obviously if it's contamination, if it's a public health issue, that's a high priority. If there's economic development possibilities that can occur, they want to hear about it. Match. The big thing that really got brought forward is if you've gone out and you've gotten the developers and you've gotten the town and you, you've really put everything on the table that you can, that's really respected. And I'll say in the grant round that was done, that was one of the evaluations and there was a lot of discussion and the town showed they'd really stretched as far as they could and then they found, again, a couple of them were lead pipe. And like, you know, we just, we can't take another loan out to go solve this last piece. And they're actually looking at violating federal grants and going and do what they had to do. And the decision was, no, we'll give you a grant. We'll go fix that very unique piece because you're already in some cases seven or eight to one leverage. And, and they really respected that. That was a big deal to the commission members because the towns have absolutely gone to the wall and they just needed that last piece to go make it a good finished project. And that's, I mean, there's no fixed answer. And that was in the stakeholder input. Everybody wanted to know, you know, what are the clear and simple rules? This is a new world. The trust fund is, you know, being run to the maximum benefit of New Hampshire. 
That's not a quantitative fixed answer. I'll stand back here if there's more information. You had a question? So the question is, are the ranking criteria publicly available? Yes, not yet for this year. <laughs> so if you go onto the Drinking Water SRF website, you'll see last year's 2017. It's called the, um, it's in the attended use plan. That's where you'll find it within that document. Um, for the most part, it stays the same every year. So you'll get a general idea of that. For 2018, that's what we're doing next on the side is we have to apply for our federal funds and draft up a whole new intended use plan. That will come up and that's part of that public hearing I mentioned in August where we will have that out for public comment. Yes, Sarah. And that's the SRF, right? Correct, yes. Just the SRF, yep. And John, the question I want to ask is, is, uh, is it true that if you were to apply for the Correct. Thank you, Sarah, for not stumping me with anything. But yes, I meant to mention that and I forgot. Is the question is if a project is funded with SRF funds and they are eligible for forgiveness, could they still get a grant from the advisory commission? The answer is yes. We will still honor that if you're eligible for forgiveness for SRF and and the trust fund comes in and they grant you, you're at the top of the list and your grant trust fund grant, yes. But they will be federal requirements. Anybody else? And as I said, feel free to, you know, get in touch with us afterwards if you think of something later on. If there's no other questions. Yes. Correct. Yep. Yeah. SRF just gets you that way. <laughs> yeah. And if also it, to add to that, the the um the question about if you get a SRF funded loan and you get a trust fund grant, you will have to follow the SRF federal cross cutters, Davis Bacon AIS. That will also apply if you are mixed with rural development funds and CDBG. So those kick in also. If you got a trust fund grant and maybe you have an RD loan, you're gonna they do RD does not have Davis Bacon, but they do have American Iron and Steel. CDBG has Davis Bacon, no American Iron, no American Iron and Steel. So figure that out. <laughs> we can help you with that part. Anything else? Yes, Frank. If you start a project, <clears throat> let's just pick one, family, and you start cleaning tanks and recoat them, in the process of getting involved in that project, and you have an SRF loan, so it was all Davis Bacon, it was all, it was advertised, it was bids, you discover other problems. Let's say, that they got down part of the insulation on the ceiling and some of the rafters are open. They need you to get a carpenter in, or you discover part of the heating system's gone, and you need to get a, somebody from the gas company. Do you then have to bring these people in on Davis Bacon and take the Davis Bacon wages? They are not associated with the principal project that you were doing, which was cleaning the tank. And this, do it. Go ahead. Yeah. So the the question is severability of state funds from federal funds, and the very very simple answer: if there is one dollar of federal funds on your project, all of the dollars have the federal cross cutters. Even if it's a new discovery of new activity, if you didn't shut the last project down, close it, finish it, you're signed, sealed, and delivered, it's still the same project. If, if you go off and fund an activity entirely on your own after you have closed another project, then the federal rules don't apply. But what I've been told is it doesn't matter if it's DOT dollars, federal, you know, if you've got a federal dollar in an active running project, that entire active running project is considered a federally funded project. 
I mean, you can get your own lawyer to take a look and maybe there's exceptions that you can find, but the simple rule that I've been told and we've heard from DOT and others, if there's a federal dollar in a project, that is a federally funded project. Uh, sir, I'm not going to give you legal advice. If you're trying to cut it that fine to get out of federal cross cutters, I think you want a lawyer involved because if you're wrong, your lawyer is going to be dealing with it. I'm not. Just. And, and Fran, I know this might be part of other previous discussions from a different project, so we could okay. talk about it on the side. <laughs> yes, Eric. Has there been uh, some thought by the board uh, to be issuing grants for planning? I know there's a big emphasis on projects this year and next, but thinking long term and high priority projects, especially considering the infrastructure. Has there been some thought by the board for that? Yep, so I'll answer and Clark can add anything if I don't get it right. If So, yes, the question is are there thoughts about providing planning grants? And yes, we definitely heard that from stakeholder feedback. We are not only on, on the SRF side, we're trying to figure out if we have a program there. There, This afternoon is primarily land conservation, this other, this non-construction category, but there is plans to do this other category where all these planning grants, um, not, I shouldn't say studies, but um, other different types of not land conservation and not construction type projects with this funding source. So that will come next. We want to get through this part of the process first, get this rolling, and then yes, address those types of projects, definitely. Anything else? Okay, so I want to first thank you all for coming. If you're staying for the afternoon, you will definitely have plenty of time to go out and have a nice lunch and come back. We are done a, a little earlier than we thought, which is not a bad thing. So if you do leave, you'll just check back in in the afternoon in the lobby like you did this morning. We do have a cafeteria downstairs if you wish to stay. So, and if you're leaving for the day, have a great day and drive safe. Thank you.